This is a recording session that I'm going to do now. Let me see if I can show you. I apologize for any background noise, or anything that you may be hearing at this point. Let's see. to move this tab out of the way. All right, so. I'm closing these intentions, right. So our last session, we looked at respiration, right? That was two sessions ago. We looked at how, um, you know, there's a panic to some degree then and so on. I would have shown you the video, so let's start back from the top. We would have started the respiratory system, right? So let's do a quick recap of what the respiratory system is and what it entails. So what does it mean to respire? It's basically the gaseous exchange. So you're taking in oxygen and you are giving out carbon dioxide, right? Um, respiration also happens during the process of, um, you know, um, consuming food. Right, so when you consume food, energy from the food, right, um, is obtained when the food is respired. So, respiration isn't only breathing in that sense, you're also looking at the energy, right, that you obtain from food. That is also a process of respiration. So, um, under the respiratory system, you have breathing and gaseous exchange. So we know breathing refers to the movement that goes air to be moved in and out of the lungs, right? So we know the lung is an organ. It's um, we have two lungs, right? It's very spongy in texture and um, there's a large surface area. So there's a large surface area so that tends to come up very often um, when we look at organs in general in the human body because the larger the surface area, it then means that there's more oxygen and so on that could come in, right? So oxygen diffuses, because remember, everything kind of ties into each other. We looked at diffusion, we looked at osmosis. Diffusion has to do with gas, osmosis has to do with water, right? So gaseous exchange is the process by which oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood, right? Humans respire aerobically, and the word aerobic means that oxygen is required. If you ever come across the word anaerobic, that means no oxygen is required right um aerobic respiration produces carbon dioxide as a waste product so again taking in oxygen releasing carbon dioxide right um for gaseous exchange surfaces gaseous exchange surfaces they form part of what is known as the respiratory system and these surfaces have several adaptations which make gaseous exchange efficient as possible so here you would see they have a large surface area which is something that i pointed out earlier on having a large surface area means large quantities of gas can be exchanged they are very thin so that gas can diffuse through them quickly they have a rich blood supply so the, the if if you ever look at videos and so on of what the lungs look like it's very bright red right um they are also moist so that gas can be dissolved before they diffuse through the surface, right? Um, we also looked at the structure of the lungs. Let me go back. Not just the structure of the lungs, but the structure of the respiratory system in general. So the respiratory system, it starts um, on your face because you have your nose and your mouth, which are two means by which you are able to take in the oxygen, right? So in humans, the gaseous exchange uh, surface is found in the lungs, which make up the respiratory system. We have two lungs, which is composed of eight passages called bronchioles. So you would notice in the book, or I have it as page 37, but the actual book might be a different page number. So just look for the structure of the human respiratory system. And you would notice that, um, you know, they have certain words highlighted in bold. And the purpose of those words being highlighted in bold is to um, help you with the study process so that you know that these are important words, words that um, 
are important to the respiratory system. So the bronchioles, right, they are um, part of the respiratory system um, that is included in the lungs, and they have millions of swollen air sacs called alveoli. So each lung is surrounded by two pleural membranes, which have pleural fluid between them. So a single bronchus leads into each lung from the trachea. So here you would see the trachea, which is part of the throat. Here, right, the larynx forms the top part of the trachea and the nasal cavity. So here, when you look at the nose, you're taking an air, you can also take in air three or more, but they all form um, part of the respiratory system. And where the air that you take in through your nose and your mouth, right, meets, you would notice that it meets at the pharynx and the larynx and then travels down the trachea. Now, it travels down the trachea, which is located to the front of the esophagus. Right, so your esophagus is here back, but your esophagus deals with taking in food. So this part here, right, where you have your epiglottis, the epiglottis actually locks behind the tongue to prevent, um, you know, anything from going down into your lung area. So the epiglottis, the purpose of the epiglottis is to prevent um, food items from going into your trachea because your trachea is for air only. That is the purpose of the trachea, right? The esophagus is for food. So always remember that the esophagus is located to the back, right? So it's located to the back of your throat. So if you were to, you know, um, cut the truth area where your voice box is, you would be exposing your trachea, right? So each lung receives blood from the heart via a pulmonary artery and blood which carries back to the heart via the pulmonary vein. So your heart also plays a role in the respiratory system. It is not um, exactly the respiratory system because when you think of the respiratory system, you think of your lungs, you think of the diaphragm and so on. But um, the purpose of your heart is to pump blood. And blood is what oxygen um, is contained in, essentially. Right? Um, So, your ribs or your rib cage also form uh, an important part of your respiratory system because it helps to protect your lungs, right? So, the two lungs, they are surrounded by the ribs which form the chest cavity or thorax. And the ribs have, um, our ribs have, um, have intercostal muscles between them. And that dome-shaped sheet of muscle is known as the diaphragm. So it stretches across the floor of the thorax, right? So let me see if I can pull up a video which shows us a, you know, a course section. Yes, virtually. Let's Okay, so let's see if this one is a good one. Okay, so I'm gonna have to take off my I need some more recording device, so I'm gonna have to take that off so you can hear the video. Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're going to take a look at the respiratory tray. I'm going to show you how we can start with a single pipe here and go all the way down to the five hundred and get the individual LVO one. We're going to have a look at the changes in the diameter of these tubes and the airways, and also the changes in the surface. So to begin, I want to start off with the trachea. So the trachea is obviously the first pipe that we we can transmit air through. And you can see we're going to have a look. The number of those branches, so every part of the branches, the number of those branches, the diameter of these tubes, and also the surface area. So, starting off here with the tree. Now, when we look at the tree here, its diameter is around about 1.8 centimeters. So, from here, here, it's around about 
right? And this is where the locks are attached to. Um, I actually have some students who did some three models of the respiratory system, and I will take some pictures and I will show you how well it was done. And, um, I'm not sure if you would ever have the opportunity to make a model like that, but um, it's actually pretty good. Uh, but yeah, but it actually shows you like if you have a, a comprehensive look at all the so these are the pleural membranes here that are located um, surrounding the lung area. So this is the actual lung. I thought they were going to ask me about my vehicle. I don't know if you did that or not. It's All right, so here it shows the structure of the human thorax, um, which is what we were looking at. So the thorax is also the chest cavity. So that's what you're seeing here, right? So this is the chest area. So your heart is located here. So notice that your rib actually protects this entire region with all these important organs. Right. So you have the lungs here, you have your heart, so it's all interconnected to help pump the um, oxygen, right, um, that you are taking in throughout your body. That's the purpose of the heart. So here, this is the alveolus, which shows the blood supply. We definitely spoke about the alveolus um, here, and these are the bronchioles. So one of these bronchioles here is attached, the bronchial here is attached to this alveoli, which obviously this is a magnified region, but this is an even greater magnified region of it. So this little part here, this is what it looks like up close. So it's basically a network of capillaries, so all of these veins and capillaries that you see surrounding it, um, and it's um, represented, the uh, different parts that are represented by red and different parts that are represented by blue. So notice the, the arrows, the blue indicates oxygen that is coming in, right? So it's coming in from the pulmonary artery and it carries the oxygenated blood. So you have the oxygenated blood coming in, right? And then um, it becomes oxygenated in the lungs, right? So you are breathing in. So when you're breathing in, that oxygen needs to then dissolve into your blood. And as it's dissolved into your blood, your heart is pumping it in to your lungs, and it becomes oxygenated in your lungs, and then your heart pumps it back out. That's how the process of breathing moves, and this is something that takes place very, very quickly, right? It's, it's like as, it's just envisioned as we're breathing right now, as I'm speaking right now with the session. Um, this process is taking place. It's such an amazing thing, actually. So, summary of the functions of the main parts of the respiratory system. You have the nasal cavity, warm, it warms the inhaled air, the mucus traps dust and pathogens in the inhaled air and moistens it. The epiglottis, the epiglottis prevents food from entering the trachea. So, remember, we said that the esophagus is located to the back of the trachea, the trachea is to the front. So the purpose of the epiglottis is to lock off any food from entering the air. Because remember, your lung is a spongy type of material. You do not want water, you do not want food entering that part. That is for air only. You have the larynx. So your larynx is basically your voice box. So that bump that you usually see, right? That is your larynx, right? The trachea and the bronchi. The purpose of the trick is to carry air in and out of the lungs, and there's rings of cartilage in these rooms which keep them open. So it doesn't collapse, right? So the trick here itself, the cartilage, um, envisioning what um, the tubing looks like in a vacuum. Envision what the tubing looks like in an AC unit, or the tubing looks like in, what do you call it? Um, I remember uh, they did what I call this um, blah, 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 washing machine. I don't know, depending on your washing machine, right? Um, but that's the, the reason why it's built in that particular way is to ensure that 
the pipe doesn't collapse and trick your um, design that exactly right the ground fuels they carry air to and from the alveoli the purpose of the alveoli is to exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide between the inhale air and the blood right so it's important to learn this table because all of the information here on this table um is examinable because at some point you're gonna have to identify what these parts do right um, the pleural membranes and the pleural fluid, what they do is they form an airtight cavity between the lungs and the ribcage so that any exchange, so that any changes, sorry, in volume of the chest cavity causes the volume inside the lungs to change. Um, and what does it do is to prevent, you know, any, um, any issues with, um, if you take in too much or there's some form of issue or anything in that manner when you put your breathing that you don't have, have issues, right? Um, right, so intercostal muscles um, contract and relax to change the volume inside the chest cavity and lungs and it causes the air to move into and out of the lungs, right? Um, right. So we also spoke about the mechanism of breathing and gaseous exchange, right? So when you inhale, right? So think about in the process of inhaling, right? Contraction happens, right? It contracts because your chest kind of goes in as you breathe in. And then when you exhale or breathe out or expire, so there are many different ways to use that too, right? Um, your external muscles relax and your internal muscles contract, right? So notice the difference here. The external contracts, so on the outward, you see it contracting when it is you inhale, right? But the internal interpersonal muscle relaxes. So inside, it looks like it's relaxing when it is your breathing in. When you are breathing out, however, your chest relaxes, but with your internal parts, the internal um, interpersonal muscles, which around the rib cage area it contracts it's a bit opposite right um so this is something that you can go through on your own so as the air is drawn in during inhalation it is warmed in the nasal passages and clean and moistened right so these are some things that we would have covered already the walls of the alveoli form the gaseous exchange surface it has a pocket shape Right, um, and a human has two lungs, each containing 350 million alveoli. So remember when we were talking about branches and how they work and so on. Right, so it gives us a very large surface area, and that is something that we definitely want. Right, um, it has a very thin wall that is only one cell thick, um, and it's also surrounded by a network of capillaries which give it a rich blood and it's aligned with moisture right so let me see okay so here we looked at what the gaseous exchange in the alveolar so before when we looked at the cross section um you know um it was showing you know all the capillaries and so on they work so this is this is i think a better cross section where you actually understand so it's the same blue and red so exhaled air comes in the oxygenated blood it mixes right and the oxygenated so sorry inhale air remember that inhale air is taken in so that's the oxygenated blood right and as you're breathing out right but when you absorb the oxygen right it releases carbon dioxide and that's when you exhale right so coming in and then going out so very very simple right um, so let's look at some factors which affect the breathing rate, right? So the normal breathing rate for healthy adults at rest ranges from 12 to 16 breaths per minute. So when it says somebody comes in for an emergency, right? So when people, you know, um, have some form of emergency and, you know, the ambulance comes for them, one of the things that they check is your pulse, which is your heart rate. And your heart rate um, has to do with your breaths per minute, right? Um, because if you're breathing normally, then your heart rate should be stable. 
So the normal breeding rate for healthy adult at rest ranges from 12 to 16 breaths per minute. The medulla of the brain, which is a part that controls breeding in the brain, right, um, detects the level of carbon dioxide in the blood and cells impulses to the muscles and the diaphragm. So it lets you know if it is that you aren't getting enough oxygen, if you aren't get, getting um, enough oxygen, and it sends the proper signals to make the necessary decision as to what you should do do you take um deep breaths because when it is you feel like you can't breathe properly right you would usually just go like that and take a deep breath but it's your brain that is sending that signal to inform you that you know things aren't working that the way that it should hold on one second Let me... okay Okay, all right, I come, I come. I'm going to have to pause. I'm going to have to Okay, so let me go back to screen sharing. I should be able to see what it's going on. Right. IDs. Nice. All right, so these are some basic factors which affect the rate, right? So normal breeding rate for healthy adults at rest ranges from 12 to 16 breaths per minute. So right now I am extremely not happy because I had to walk up and down the stairs. So you can just when you run, when you walk very quickly and so on, you tend to get out of breath. And that's the means that you need to take in. Because what, what, what that simply means is the simple act of walking, just doing daily activities and so on, and cause um, your body to expel more carbon dioxide than it's taking in oxygen. So, this is one of the reasons why you need to take bigger, deeper breaths. You need to be able to take in the correct amount of oxygen that would um, match up to the amount that you are expelling. Right? So, any factor that increases the rate of respiration in body cells will cause the level of carbon dioxide in the blood to increase. So if carbon dioxide levels increase, breathing rate increases to remove the excess carbon dioxide. So for example, when we were talking about the walking and so on, we need them to breathe. Like just now I had to walk up and down the stairs and to move my vehicle and whatever. So carrying on exercise. Taking certain drugs that are stimulants, so coffee contains a stimulant known as caffeine, and caffeine could increase your heart rate, which also um, has an effect on your breathing rate. While smoking cigarettes, so smoking cigarettes is a big one because what that does, it actually um, adds another gas into your respiratory system called carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, what it does, it, it basically cancels out the oxygen that you are taking in. And it, it then makes that your lungs have to be twice as hard for you to be able to breathe. But one of the things um, that people can also consider is um, cigarettes also contain something called nicotine or tar. Um, that nicotine, which is addictive, and that tar, which builds up in your lungs over time, right? Because if you've ever looked at, let's see if we could pull up. What a smoker lungs look like. Right? Smoker lungs. Smoking lungs, this is healthy lungs. Right? So you, I don't think you're necessarily only for this, it's just to see. I'm just right off the bat, just looking at the thumbnail. You can actually see the color, right? You can actually see the color of the, the, the lungs, see the comparison and the difference. Look at what healthy um, look at it. So 
Ito sa pagkis ha. Ridiculous. So, let's see if you put on. Let me see if I can put on some actions. Okay, it's on a bit of this is basically what your lungs look like when it is you're breathing in and breathing out, right? You're seeing it actually moving, right? So air passes through your nose and mouth, then the trachea or windpipe, right? So these represent the trachea. So the cilia, the tiny hairs which are located in your nose, right? Then it comes on. So this is where the branches are. Remember, we saw all the branches and so on. This is where it's located. Very nice. So you have tiny air sacs over 600 ml, which is known as the alveoli or the alveolus, right? Very good. So I know you can't hear what she's saying, so I will link this video so that you'll be able to watch it um, outside of this recording. Right. Right, so the ties is the substance that um the ties is the substance that builds up on your lungs. Right. Okay, so that basically gives you um, an idea of what um, a healthy lung looks like this non-smoking. Right. So suffering from anxiety or fear. So persons who have like a lot of anxiety and so on, you would notice that they need to take a lot of deep breaths because that anxiousness. Remember, breathing is controlled by a part in your brain. And the medulla, which is the part of the brain that is responsible for breathing, sometimes we can have um, you know mental little mental anxieties and so on, which frustrates you and it um, in the end ends up having an effect on your breathing because you feel anxious or you feel very scared. So some persons, you know, when they feel very scared, um, it has a direct impact, impact on how they're able to breathe. Right? Being exposed to certain environments or conditions. So when you are confined in a, in a small space, when you have to breathe in polluted air and so on, um, it affects your breathing. Being at high altitude. So did you know that the more the higher that you go up the mountain, the thinner the air is and the um, as a result of that, you know, the oxygen levels drop and you will need oxygen. So for those who climb Mount Everest and all these, um, you know, high places, uh, you know, your breathing becomes a little bit more labored because you have to try to fight to get more oxygen, basically. Right? Also being overweight. So being overweight, being unhealthy. Remember, this is what HSV is all about. HSV teaches you about the human body, how it works, why it works the way that it works, and so on. It's not just looking at um, the biology or the biological components, but also how your lifestyle may impact a lot of these um, you know, bodily function. So we know that breathing is something um, second nature to us. It's something that we do. There's something that we need to do that is necessary for survival. And our lifestyle could impact this. Our lifestyle has an impact on this. And we need to be able to make the necessary changes, lifestyle changes, and so on, where it's not negatively impacted. So any factor that decreases the rate of respiration and body cells will cause the level of carbon dioxide in the blood to decrease. So if carbon that carbon dioxide levels decrease, then breathing rate decreases. Factors which decrease breathing rates when resting while asleep. So when your body is at rest, you're not moving about, you're not exerting much energy, and so when your body is at total rest, your breathing is more even, right? When you're taking certain drugs, so certain drugs that make you very sleepy, right? We know that there are certain medications which can be, um, you know, considered um, drowsy, drowsy medications. So like when you have the flu, you can buy drowsy, non-drowsy. So those non, so those drowsy medications, um, they act as a depressant, right? So the sedatives, the pills, even alcohol can make you, um, you know, feel like your body is at rest in a way and it would um, decrease your breathing levels. Right, being exposed to certain environmental conditions. So if you are in a space where the air is not polluted, where um, you know there's a lot of fresh air and so on, you don't have to breathe as um, as, as much. And that's not to say you don't breathe, but you would not have to try as hard to breathe the way that somebody who 
um, it's an occluded environment, so it's in a place that has a lot of CO2 and so on, would have to breathe, right? Now we move on to something known as vital capacity. What is vital capacity? So vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled from the lungs after inhaling as deeply as possible. So there's only so much air that you are able to take in at a time, right? It's not as though, um, you know, you take this much deeper breath than you usually would and, um, you know, um, take in more oxygen. And what that simply means, the persons especially who would have um, contracted COVID, for instance, COVID, um, what it did was it affected the respiratory system, it affected the lungs of even healthy patients, but more or less affected those who had comorbidities with pre existing conditions, right? So the lung function or lung capacity of someone who is sick, someone who has pneumonia, someone who has COVID, as I said, is going to be a lot less because they aren't able to take deep breaths. I remember recently, even myself, I can speak for myself when I was sick, when um, I got sick, and this would have been in January of this year, I was able to take really deep breaths. And when I was trying to take deep breaths, like actually sit and just very calmly take in air, um, I was starting to cough. And um, I realized it was a scary feeling, you know, not being able to take a deep breath, basically. And I felt like I was unable to take in the correct amount of oxygen. So measuring lights of capacity, as I said, is used to indicate lung function. Disease. So vital capacity depends on the age, gender, body size, and fitness. It can be increased by regular exercise, and it can be decreased by smoking, obesity, or respiratory disease. So basically, just keeping yourself as healthy as possible would help to increase your lung function. So patients who suffer with asthma, right? Um, you know, doctors advise them to increase their activity, increase running, increase movement, and so on. And that might seem counterintuitive because it's like, why are you asking someone who has all these issues breathing to, um, you know, then exit themselves more? But what you're doing is you're actually exercising the lung. So the, your lung is like an organ, it's a muscle. And it's important to give that enough, I would say, exercise in a way to allow breathing to occur as easily as possible, right? So here it shows lung capacities and volume. So the tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled and exhaled in a normal breath. So tide, if you notice how tides go, think about tide in the ocean, right? Tides in the ocean, they, they come and they go. When, when the tide is high, when the tide is low, right? And the tide is what causes waves as well. So look at these waves here, they look up and down, up and down. And notice there's a huge, a huge curve here and then a, a, a big dip. So if it is, you have to take a big breath, that's where that is, and breathe out here. You notice that it's not going in a normal flow, right? So here it shows the vital capacity. If somebody is able to breathe in and take a good deep breath, it means their lungs are working the way that it should be. Right? If somebody is unable to do that, well, it shows that the you know, device capacity um, is being affected by either some you know, respiratory disease or illness or obesity or whatever the case may be. Right? Next, we move on to multi mouth resuscitation. And I think we would um I think we would stop off here for this session, right? So multi mouth resuscitation is known as rescue breathing is a technique which is used to supply oxygen to a person who has stopped breathing. The rescuer basically forces his or her exhaled air, which contains about 16% oxygen, into the victim's lungs every few seconds. So yes, we know exhaled air contains high amounts of carbon dioxide, right? But it also, to a certain degree, can um, you know, contain some oxygen in it, especially if it is you are breathing it out very quickly. So you're not allowing the natural function of breathing to take place. You're just breathing out very quickly, right? So when that happens, um, you know, it contains some level of oxygen. 
So the rest of forces has a little X field here, which contains about 16% oxygen into the victim's lungs every few seconds, allowing for passive exhalation in between. So to perform multiple resuscitation, these are some tips and some steps. This is obviously something that is better practiced, right? So let's look at a look at. what it entails. So how to administer a warrant, a short one. So this one is a short one. So again, the audio, because I'm using headphones, you're not going to hear the audio. Right, it's basically just an animation to show. So the person must be able to lie flat on their back. Right. So this is a rescuer, this is a person who is sick. And this. So after opening the casualties airway, you need to check whether he or she is breathing. So that's where the fingers are here. So the fingers is here to check for the pulse. Once you have determined that it's not normal breathing, right? Obviously to So at some point you're gonna have to do some chest compressions and so on. Right, so here the person is still checking to see. You notice how you put the hand over the chest, interlock your fingers and press four to five centimeters down. So you're not pressing too hard, right? You're just creating a pressure with each compression to kind of like um jump start over and into um, the person, right? You cover their nose and you pump your exhaled air. See their chest is rising. And then you pump again. The rate of compression should be about 100 compressions per minute. Nice. So that basically um, ends our session now. And we will continue on with the effects of smoking cigarettes and as I said I have some nice models to show you um, of what healthy lungs should look like so um, I hope you understood everything that was covered today I know there's a lot of information but you are free to reach out to me via my email gmail.com should you have any questions or so take care.